All marine animals, they rely primarily on sound as their primary sense to find prey, to navigate, to communicate with each other, and to find mates. So sound is incredibly important for all these animals. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Blue whales are the largest animals ever to inhabit our planet. They can live up to 110 years, average over 70 feet in length, and 100 metric tons in weight. The biggest individuals eat up to six tons of krill every day. In the era of commercial whaling, they were hunted to near extinction. Blue whale hunting has been banned since 1966, but they remain on the International Union for Conservation of Nature's red list of threatened species and are considered endangered. Our guest today is Kate Stafford, Associate Professor and Bioacoustician at Oregon State University's Marine Mammal Institute, who has tracked blue whales using their vocalizations. Here is a sample with the note that it has been sped up for the human ear to be able to hear it. Dr. Stafford, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nate. I'm really happy to be here. Is it difficult to record whale sound? Um, it, it depends upon how you want to record whale sound. So in fact, anytime you put a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone out in the water, you're always going to be surprised at what you hear. And nowadays, the tools we have and the ability to record over long time periods in remote areas, it's gotten a lot more affordable, it's gotten a lot more possible, and a lot of the analysis tools that we use now make it a lot easier to record and then study and analyze whale calls. So it's not that hard. Um, For this particular study, we studied blue whales, and that's what I've studied quite a bit throughout my career. And the problem with blue whales is you can record them, but you can't hear them while you're recording them generally. Blue whales make sounds that are below human hearing. We've played a sample at the top of the show with the note that it was sped up, I believe, five times from the labeling on the file to make it so we can hear it. Before we get into the recording for this, the the Seychelles ILS, can we talk about their history and relationship with the blue whales and the Seychelles? Sure. Well, what's really interesting about the Seychelles is in 1978, when the Seychelles nation, which is an African nation off the east coast of Africa, When they first joined an organization called the International Whaling Commission, they proposed that the Indian Ocean, all of the Indian Ocean south to 55 degrees south latitude, become a whale sanctuary. And so that was really their first move and their first role in the International Whaling Commission. And what's important to know is that in the Indian Ocean, uh, there was a tremendous amount of illegal hunting of all whales, but blue whales in particular in the 1960s. And over 300 blue whales were taken by Soviet whalers just to the northwest of the Seychelles in the 60s. At that time, given that blue whales have globally been still brought down to less than 1% of the population pre-whaling, that was a, a big number of whales. Up until very recently, it wasn't clear that blue whales still occurred in the Seychelles. That, that that was going to be one of my questions here. Like, I know there was some kind of opportunistic spotting that kind of led to you being out there. Um, I guess, how many, how often do they come through? How? Well, that that's a really good question, Nate. Um, so we went on a couple of expeditions to the Seychelles in the month of November, because that is when people had recently seen blue whales off the Seychelles. And when I say see blue whales off the Seychelles, it's not dozens. It might be one or two or as many as six at a time, but relatively few blue whales. And that sort of caught the imagination of a filmmaker named Hugh Pearson, who is quite a blue whale um, admirer. Mm. And so he wanted to go and mount this expedition to the Seychelles and find blue whales. And Coincidentally, at the same time, uh, Dr. Jeremy Kiska, who is a colleague of mine and is a co-author on this paper, he had approached me before he would even approach either of us and said, let's go to the Seychelles, put some hydrophones out, take out a boat, and study marine mammals there. So it was a really uh, nice serendipity that Hugh was interested in blue whales at the Seychelles, and Jeremy and I were interested in overall species diversity and abundance in the Seychelles. 
So what what was that process like, I guess, working with a film crew in having that bleed into the scientific research? Was it was it an issue kind of getting the two things go in the same direction? It can be. So any scientists who've interacted with film crews in the field know that film crews have, you know, they've got what they want to do. They almost always want to support the science fully, mostly, not always, but but in this case, the film crew we worked with really did. But it does mean having to say things over again and point at things over again. But um, the really nice part about working with this film crew is we were able to work much further offshore than we would have normally with a much bigger boat. Um, And we had a lot more eyes on the water to spot whales. You know, I feel like... Part of my obligation as a scientist is to share the results of our science and to share the results of our science, not just in scientific journals to our fellow scientists, but but more broadly to a global audience, to a local audience, and really highlight for people who may not know where the Seychelles are, may never go there, what a special place it is and how biodiverse it is. Right. And it really is a stunning movie. We did get to see it. Uh, I believe the title is Return of the Giants. Well, and what um, I really liked about that, and and this again gets, well, not again, but this gets to the, the NSF contribution, is in addition to the film, they produced all sorts of little educational uh, snippets that teachers can use in their classroom that discuss things about the sounds that whales make, how do they eat. and And those I found to be really great to watch as a scientist who knows what they're talking about. Right. You get kind of that broad interaction and a a better chance to kind of raise awareness and get it in people's heads. It's always a good thing. We're trained in outreach and education doing it as opposed to those of us who really try, but might flounder around a little bit. (laughs) So I I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about the recording off the Dennis islands. Um, I did get to check out the, the device a little bit, the the big microphones or the hydrophone. And it's it's very interesting how long term you can do and these kind of things now. So I wanted to hear about that. And I wanted to hear there was a note that you downsampled the audio from 48K. And for me, that seems unusual. Well, for you it seems unusual because you work with sound. Um when we think about using sound, using underwater acoustics for science, Sometimes we're only analyzing relatively low frequency sounds, so sounds that are low in pitch. And if you've got a super high sample rate, because we're not interested in audio fidelity, uh, it just makes it a lot faster to do the analysis, to let our computer automatically detect signals. So downsampling just speeds everything up. It also takes a lot less space on our computers. Right. <laughs> everything we have is is digital. It's all bits. It's not tapes. Right. And if, and, and if so much of that data is just not of use, really, there's no reason to have it. Yeah. So I'll say the data aren't of use for the blue whale story, but we recorded dolphins and humpback whales and lots of snapping shrimp. So there's a tremendous amount of other information in those data at frequencies higher than those that we downsampled. So we still have the full broadband 48 kilohertz data. Right. As as the recording comes in, it's still at the higher quality. It's just what what you're using for the analysis, I guess, would be lower. We don't throw data away. (laughs) <laughs> so I, I want to hear some about the the challenges of recording in the environment, noises you might hear, uh, the the waves itself, ships. Like like what are you? What are the other things that you accidentally run into? Sure. Well, when we put a hydrophone or, or an underwater microphone down, we are recording all the sounds in the soundscape. So much as if you went outside and went to your corner in your neighborhood, you would record the birds and the cars and the kids. And maybe if there was a windstorm, you'd record that. Underwater, we record wave noise. We can record fish. We record, especially in the tropics, lots of snapping shrimp. Um, And we record whales. We also record the sounds of humans. And by that, I mean the sounds of ships. So all of those sounds make up the soundscape. And out of those sounds, we have to pick out the signals of interest. So in our case, it was the signals of blue whales. Uh, is it difficult to separate or identify what those bits of the information are? Sometimes. It's, sometimes it's difficult to separate the information. Um, fortunately, all marine animals, whether they're fish, 
or snapping shrimp, invertebrates, or large whales or dolphins, they rely primarily on sound as their primary sense, right? We humans, most of us, but not all of us, we're visual animals. So we rely on our, our sense of sight to navigate our world. Animals underwater have to use sound. Sound travels much further underwater than it does in air. It doesn't attenuate, which means it, it doesn't get quieter as it travels out. And so they use sounds to find prey, to navigate, to communicate with each other and keep in contact, to find mates. So sound is incredibly important for all these animals. And one of the nice things, uh, especially about marine animals, is we can actually tell different species apart from each other. I, I don't think we're very good at telling individuals apart, mm. but I can tell a blue whale from a humpback whale from a snapping shrimp. So all of these animals use different durations of signals and different frequencies or, or pitch of signals to communicate. And a blue whale is really distinct from, say, a humpback whale. Now, I know you've got to do some of this kind of research more in the Arctic and Antarctic areas also. Does that change the kind of sounds or is it more just the populations that are there are different? Well, it certainly changes the kind of sounds because the populations there are different. We don't, for instance, have snapping shrimp in the Arctic or the Antarctic, which is a bonus because snapping shrimp are really loud. I mean, about <laughs> you, it's as if you live next to a freeway. And there's this constant hum of, which means that everything has to be a little bit louder to be heard further. And so the, the biodiversity of an area can be studied simply by listening to what you hear underwater. So you've talked about being able to identify the different species and how they use vocalization for different kind of tasks, traveling or finding food, etc. What have you learned about what they're saying? Like, are you able to identify the different kinds of vocalization for the different activities? In some instances, we are able to identify the different vocalizations and associate with them activities. So for instance, um, blue whales or humpback whales, who are probably better known, they, they sing during the winter. And we believe based on um, tags that have, been, that have been put on singing whales, that it's primarily just the males. And because it's a seasonal behavior, we think it's a reproductive behavior, whether that's sort of as a male-male uh, dominance interaction or whether females might be eavesdropping to decide which male makes the best sound and that's who she wants to mate with. Um, that's still up for debate, although largely it seems that, that singing in large whales plays both those roles. In blue whales, they also make a signal very uh, cleverly called the D call for down sweep. And we believe that all both sexes make this. And D calls have been associated with feeding behavior, with agonistic behavior between whales, uh, with animals that are in close contact, they might just whoop each other. And so we think that D calls play a different ecological role. But you know, because studying animals who make sounds underwater, who spend more than 95% of their lives underwater, associating what they're doing when they're making the sounds is really difficult, there's still so much room for exploration and discovery, which is at the same time exciting, but can also be a little bit frustrating because we don't have eyes underwater. And there was an interesting quote from you where you talked about hearing climate change. And I'd like to know more about what you're hearing and what you mean when you say that. Well, so when I have to give like my one line elevator pitch of my job, I would say that I listen to climate change. And that's largely because most of my work actually takes place in the Arctic. Um, and in the Arctic, we are hearing new species move further north and stay there longer. So we're hearing killer whales and fin whales and humpback whales move into the Arctic much further north and stay there for many, many, many months of the year, largely because sea ice extent has decreased and the seasonality at which much of the Arctic is covered with sea ice has declined. So that, that has led to new opportunities for some of these subarctic species. They have more habitat, more access to food. But if you think about places like the Seychelles, which of course are are very different from the Arctic. Uh, you couldn't really be much further from the Arctic. Different species of animals underwater 
Oh, well, and even terrestrial species. We all have our, our temperature niche. Like I, I've lived in the Pacific Northwest for many, many years now, and I like it like 80 is too hot for me. I like it about 65, 70. People I know in San Diego can't tolerate anything below 70 degrees. So as the climate warms and as temperatures warm from the tropics to the poles, species that are used to the warm water in the tropics might be escaping increasingly hot water and they move north to find sort of their, their perfect temperature. So we do see species shifting their distribution. And for large whales who are capable of long distance migrations, they carry a lot of food on their bodies. You know, they can be really flexible about where and when they feed. But if their prey shifts, they need to follow that prey. And so in that way, by listening to whales, who are an indicator species for what's going on at lower trophic levels, we can tell about distribution shifts globally and essentially listen to climate change. Special thanks to Kate Stafford. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.